everybody can hear me. Um, first of all, thank you so much um, for running this event, um, Serene and the whole team, and thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Mike Farley, and I've been teaching uh, middle and high school geography for 20 years here in Toronto. Um, I was 10 years in the Toronto board, and then I've spent the last 10 years at University of Toronto Schools, which is a, an independent school affiliated with the U of T. Um, and in terms of the session today, um, I have three kind of main goals that I'd like to achieve with you. And the first is to explore the role that animal sanctuaries can play in introducing students to the concept and practice of animal protection. And the second is to gain a better understanding of how two virtual field trips to Ontario animal sanctuaries were run. Um, those are the ones that I ran and, and look at the accompanying scaffolding that would go um, with that in terms of curriculum, um, how to enhance the learning. And then finally, um, to explore other virtual field trip opportunities, including those in BC, uh, but even further afield um, globally as well. Great. So, uh, you know, my own journey into animal protection was a long kind of simmering one. I, I was vegetarian for about 20 years, started in university, but to be honest, that was mainly um, for carbon emissions reasons. It was more for the environmental impacts. Um, animal protection, for whatever reason, um, it didn't really register uh, with me. I hadn't really done a deep dive into that area, but things really took a shift um, about three years ago my wife and I adopted uh, this little sweetheart, Maggie, um, from a rescue organization that got her out of a puppy mill in West Virginia. And when we first um, got her, we, we were told that she was probably, you know, one and a half or two years old. I think they'd rescued about a hundred puppies. So they'd done a quick diagnostic on each one. But when we took her to our vet and the vet did a, a pretty deep um, kind of overview and exa examination of her, she said, no, no, she'd actually, you know, was more like five or six and had given, um, you know, countless litters. And I know there was just something that broke inside of both of us when we were walking home with her from that visit. Um, something finally gave. And, and we started to make that connection between, you know, her conditions in a puppy mill and the conditions of, of various animals other than companion animals and their plight. And we realized that, you know, there wasn't really any difference. And we actually had to, um, you know, treat the same way we want to treat uh, Maggie. We want uh, other animals to be treated uh, as well. So that um, set me on a journey. And, and, you know, even before that, I've been dabbling as a teacher in animal protection in my classes for about 10 years or so. Um, but to be honest, they were more um, issues that were a little more removed from, from my life and from students' lives. So we looked at, for example, the dolphin hunt in Taiji, Japan. Um, and, you know, and also part of that is that there, there aren't really any expectations in the Ontario curriculum, at least for geography, that even mention animal protection. So I, I you know, over the years, I was trying different things out, but um, I wanted to learn more about animal protection and how to incorporate that increasingly in my teaching. And so I started an MED in Humane Education through the Institute of Humane Education. And the thing that I was really attracted to about this program, which um, is the reason people on this, this call today as well, is just that, that third element of animal protection, um, which seems to be missing from so many um, other areas of looking at social justice, environmental issues. And, and, and maybe more importantly, this program is looking at the intersection of those three areas as well, which is critically important. Um, you know, around the same time, I, I started looking at and visiting animal sanctuaries around Ontario. I didn't really know anything about them. I didn't know how a sanctuary really differed from a zoo. Um, uh, and I started to learn more about them. Um, and I really fell in love with them. Um, I'd never really seen anything like that where, you know, places had been set up solely for the needs of the animals as opposed to you know humans first and then animals kind of second and um and i just felt they were like the most sacred places on the planet to be honest i, I just um given the degree that we exploit animals in pretty much every way shape or form 
um, you know, globally. It was just so magical to be at a place where, you know, the opposite was true. So as a result, um, I started to look at animal sanctuaries more, more closely, you know, in terms of how I could incorporate these into my uh, teaching. Um, but I, I, had to, I had to get clear, you know, for myself about what these are. So, um, and, you know, if you want to, um, I'll just open up the Q&A here. If anybody wants to answer any of these questions, is, and I know we've got a wide range of people on this call. I mean, I'm sure there's people on this call who are running sanctuaries. So I don't mean to be <laughs> presumptuous here, but, but I, I just wanted to start, because these are good questions that I went through for myself. And also we, I went through with my students just to get clear about this is like, what is um, an animal sanctuary? Does anybody have any ideas about that? I'm not sure. I can't see the chat right now. So Serene, I don't know if you're there. Oh, there we go. There's the chat. So um, does anybody, and again, I'm not sure if people can see this, but does anybody have any ideas about um, what a sanctuary is or if you've been to a sanctuary? Um, or what are the main types of sanctuaries? Okay, good. I see a couple coming. That's good. So I, I know it's working. Out. So um, Kali says, I found an animal sanctuary to be a safe place, place unlike other places farm animals are kept. Yeah, perfect. And Jennifer wrote, uh, animal sanctuary is a place where animals are allowed to live their whole lives free from human harm. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah, that was, that's really, it's, it's a huge shift, right? To actually, and the students and I, we really kind of struggled with this. We just it's like, oh, you know, this is a completely different way of, of looking at animals. And, you know, as well, we looked at, you know, sanctuaries are not just kind of all uniform. There's different types. We looked at farm animal sanctuaries. We looked at sanctuaries for exotic animals. Um, we looked at sanctuaries uh, for wildlife, um, for companion animals. So we did a, did a bit of a deep dive on that together. I'll just minimize that there. And um, here I actually kind of laid this out and, and we went through together um, as a class trying to figure this out. It's like, okay, the difference between a shelter, sanctuary, accredited zoo or aquarium versus a theme park or roadside zoo. And you know, we looked at things like, you know, what are, how, how do these uh, animal institutions acquire animals? You know, are they, are they bred? Are they purchased? Are they rescued? Um, what is the relationship to human beings? you know, for the animals in these animal institutions? Um, is it animals first, that their needs always uh, usurp an, uh, human uh, needs? Or, or is it more for entertainment purposes and the animals again are, are much secondary to that? Um, we looked at like enrichment, you know, what their daily life looks like. Um, and then we looked at some examples. So it was very interesting to kind of go through that and get clear about that. Um, you know, and then, you know, animal sanctuaries, they really are, if you look at the numbers, um, they're really a drop in the bucket. So about 800 million land animals are killed for food in Canada every year. Um, there's a, a pig slaughterhouse, uh, about a 45 minute drive from my home here, that, uh, the Fearman pig slaughterhouse that kills about 10,000 pigs every day. So if you look at the actual numbers of animals that are being saved and rescued by sanctuaries, it, it's very small. Um, but, but, you know, sanctuaries have a much bigger ripple effect. Um, and so I just wanted, this is a, a, a video I wanted to show of Farm Sanctuary, which talks about the power of sanctuary. Let's see if I can play this here. Sanctuaries are a place where cruelty is met with kindness. It's about kindness to animals, but it's also about respecting others, respecting ourselves, respecting the earth, living in a way that doesn't cause unnecessary harm. We live at a time when there's immense oppression and strain and ugliness out in the world, and this harms all of us. The reason things are as bad as they are is because we have infrastructures and systems in place and those need to be shifted. 
that actually undermines our empathy. And that's a very important part of our humanity. For me and for many people, this begins with recognizing trauma and violence and cruelty in the world and not wanting to be part of it. These animals, like other animals, want to live. They don't want to be abused. They don't want to be killed. They don't want to be eaten. They want to live just like cats or dogs or us. We're all animals and we all have pretty much the same desires. Yeah, I, I just thought that was a beautiful um, introduction to the philosophy of sanctuaries, you know, what they're actually there, the, the kind of role that they have in educating um, people and the ripple effect again. Um, so then this led me to actually getting down to business and, um, and figuring out how to run a field trip so I could have shared this experience with my students. And I was looking specifically at grade seven. So my original, this is uh, about a year ago, um, I had set up a, a, a field trip for my grade seven geography students um, to go to the Don Carey Sanctuary of Canada, which is in Guelph, just outside of Toronto. Um, and it was one of the only, um, I mean, actually it was the only in-person field trip I could find to a sanctuary. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that that I'll talk about in a bit, but um, they had an outreach program, they could handle a number of students. Uh, we had about hundred students coming um, and, uh, and everything was great until the pandemic hit, you know, and, uh, everything got shut down. So it was around March where we decided all field trips were going to, were going to be a stop. So as a result, I reached out to two sanctuaries. First, I reached out to Donkey Sanctuary and see if they would do anything virtually, but they weren't set up at that point to be able to do something like that. So then I reached out to the Storybook Farm Primate Sanctuary, which is about an hour and a half outside of Toronto, and also the Happily Ever Aster Farm Sanctuary, um, which is about an hour outside of Toronto. And um, both of them said, hey, we've never done anything like this before, um, but we're game to try. And I said, well, I'm in the same boat. I've never done anything like this before either. Um, so, so that's what we ended up doing. And I thought I'd just play a quick video here just to give you a sense of what each sanctuary is all about. So I'm just gonna have to click to another screen here. They are so much like us. Because of that, that we should give them the freedom that they, they should have. I used to work in advertising, wear four inch heels, designer clothing. Now I clean monkey poop and this is what that looks like. Cleaning the monkey. Welcome to Storybook Farm Primate Sanctuary, the home of 19 monkeys. I started volunteering here about six years ago, and then eventually I started doing more and more with the sanctuary. Four years ago, it was put up for sale, so I went on the board and helped with fundraising, then became a co-owner. Do you want to pick one? Oh, you can't have all of them. My mantra became failure is not an option. If we hadn't succeeded in buying this property, there was nowhere else for the monkeys to go. They would have had to be euthanized. The sanctuary now is, is my life. <laughs> so whether they come from roadside zoos or whether they've been pets, this is the only other place for them to go in Canada. Rudy. Rudy was in a storage container full of exotic animals that were going to be then sold, which unfortunately is legal in most of Canada. He was close to death when he was um, surrendered to us. He chewed off the hair of his tail. Now he's sort of a model squirrel monkey. It's great when they start doing things that they would do in the wild, such as, you know, washing a grape um, in the leaf. It is so cruel what happens to them before they go to market. They are taken away from their mothers if they're being bred in captivity. And if they're being poached in the wild, Inevitably, the whole family needs to be killed because the family will protect the baby to the death. Here we have two of the most famous monkeys in Canada. Pockets is the diva. <laughs> he likes attention, you know, he's an artist. Pockets really took to painting. He's apparently one of the top 10 primates who paint in the world. Pockets does allow his artwork to be sold. Superheroes never fade. Dandelions, homo sapiens. 
Darwin, he was called the Ikea monkey because he was found in an Ikea parking lot. Somehow he had managed to unlock the cage he was in. He was wearing a little shearling coat and a diaper. It caused quite the sensation around the world. He's very energetic. He has a great relationship with Pierre, our baboon. He's very strong. He can bend rebar. It'd be tough to change his diapers these days. <laughs> Monkeys do not make good pets, but unfortunately, there are still people who believe that they can be. See, that's what can happen. You know, even though you're being nice to them and you're giving them a treat, they can just suddenly, suddenly turn. In 2016, there were 7,500 monkeys in labs in Canada. The lab monkeys that just arrived are Cody, Pugsley, and Cedric, and they're beautiful crab-eating macaques. It's the first time that lab monkeys have officially been allowed to retire to sanctuary. The day they arrived it was raining and so they really didn't know what it was and because there was all this rain coming down on them. When we were releasing them from their travel cages which were essentially four by four by four they did not look back they just went for it they didn't know what was ahead of them um, they just went for it. We cried a lot that day because um, it was so great to see them just not question the opportunities that they were being given. Like somehow they seemed to understand that it was going to be better. Okay, so I'm going to stop that there. But I, it, I, I just, this is a bit of a side note, but my wife and I have been volunteering there for the past uh, month or so, going up once a week. And, uh, to see this video now and to know a lot the monkeys a lot better and to have cleaned a lot of their poop um, and to kind of be behind the scenes it's it really is a beautiful place so um, I was really happy that <laughs> worked out and then the second um, sanctuary was happily ever Esther home of Esther the wonder pig and also about 60 other farm animals so I just wanted to give you a sense of what um, Esther's is all about the best thing about Esther is her personality and her character. It's it's almost like dealing with a human. It changed pretty much every aspect of our lives from where we work to um, our lifestyle. We, we gave up the use of all animal products after getting to know Esther and what her life could have been like if she wasn't with us. And it's been a wild few years that resulted in us giving up our careers and, and opening a sanctuary for animals like Esther, all farmed animals. Esther uh, came into our lives via Facebook, actually, which is kind of ironic now looking back. And I got a message from a friend I hadn't spoken to in years and years that just said she knew I was an animal lover and asked if I wanted a mini pig. And went home the next day with this little four pound mini pig that was supposed to be 70 pounds. Um, it turned out obviously that she was not a mini pig and she grew to about 650 pounds. We noticed that Esther wasn't going to be the micro pig we were told she was the very first time she went to the vet. Esther is going to be five years old on July 1st. Uh, she currently weighs about 630 to 650 pounds and she's about maybe six feet long. We definitely thought about having to give her up, not because we wanted to, but we weren't sure whether we could handle it. She was getting so big, so fast. At her quickest, it was a pound a day she was growing. And we lived in a town where she was illegal. We weren't even allowed to have a pot-bellied pig, never mind a full-size commercial pig. I was, my reaction when we first found out she wasn't a micro pig was a real mixed reaction. Um, I was furious for feeling like I'd been lied to. I was really upset about her and this this wave of guilt I think it was is probably the best way to describe it. <laughs> Esther eats about eight cups a day of a kibble that we have made for her and for the other animals, other pigs that live at the farm. It's uh, high fiber and low fat to help kind of manage her weight. We decided to set up a Facebook page in December of 2014 or 2013. I can't even remember now. The years are just a blur. And it was a total spur of the moment thing. So these, all the artwork that we've got has come from fans. They've, they've painted them themselves. I think this is one of the first ones we got that was painted actually via a Facebook photo that we had posted. 
really, really amazing. It's been the most incredible experience. I, I don't know fully how to put into words what it's been like the last couple of years. It's, it's been so overwhelming and um, surreal, probably, is, is, is the best way to put it. You know, I mean, I wake up every morning and look outside to a 50-acre property full of animals that I had never even met you know, two or three years ago, all because of a mini pig, you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Okay, so that is uh, Esther the Wonder Pig and Happily Ever Esther uh, Farm Sanctuary. And, uh, you know, so that just to give you a sense of what those are two very different uh, sanctuaries. One is a farm sanctuary, the other is for exotic animals. Um, and, you know, again, as I was mentioning before, we really had to start from scratch in terms of trying to figure out how to run these virtual field trips. So, you know, the, the first thing was, is that there's no stable internet connection on the grounds of either of the sanctuaries. Um, so we would, what we decided to do for that for storybook, the primate sanctuary, we did a pre-recorded video tour. And then we followed that with a live Q&A from um, Dinah's home in Toronto. So Dinah was the one featured in the film. She's the, uh, the founder, the co-owner of, uh, of the storybook sanctuary. Um, and so that worked really well, and I'll show you a clip of that in a second. And then for Happily Ever Aster Farm Sanctuary Heaps, um, for that, they, we just uh, decided to do a live Q&A right from inside their farmhouse with Steve, Derek, Steve and Derek and uh, Esther, of course. Um, we had about 100 grade seven students. They were all um, using uh, Google Meet, which worked well. Um, and for us, we, because there was multiple classes that were participating and the classes take place at different times of, of the day and week, we decided to do it like technically after school. Again, this was in the spring with the virtual environment. Um, and, and I mean, pretty much every single student got on, even though technically it was after school. Um, so I'm just going to play a short clip of what each looked like, just to give you a sense. So you had a sense of like, kind of professionally shot videos about each sanctuary, but this is a little clip from the actual uh, video, pre-recorded video tour we did, so you get a sense of what the students were seeing. Jenkins is a spider monkey, and they traditionally... I'll just say to the the sound on this is quite low, so you might want to turn your sound up just for this uh, video clip here. Swing from tree to tree in the wild, and so you can see that he's highly equipped to do that. And so again, as part of the design of the enclosures, we give him places to climb and so he can swing from area to area um, to get his exercise and also to, be, to allow him to do behaviors that are instinctive to him. Would you like another one? Is that what you're saying? Would you like another one? Give him a nice one. He wants to see what else I've got. Yeah, no. <laughs> if I gave him the whole bowl, he would take the whole bowl. And there's Max. Hi, Max. Okay, so that I know the sound that again, this is because it was our first time, the sound was a little low, but it, at least it gives you a sense of, of what that uh, looked like. And then if we go on to um, this was again from uh, Steve and Derek's uh, living room with Esther, and this was part of the Q&A. So the sound is regular for this one. So you might want to turn it down uh, for this so you don't get a shock to your ears. Perfect. Very good. Okay. Sebastian, you've got a great question. You want to unmute yourself there? Yes. Uh, so, um, I was wondering, like, because you've been here for, like, uh, a good amount of time, um, I was wondering what your favorite moment of, like, being part of the sanctuary is, because I know it's, like, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know what my favorite moment is. Uh, my favorite moment was when we first arrived here with Esther and yeah. offloaded her off of the trailer. Yeah, mine too. Uh, when we lived in Georgetown um, in a small house with a small yard, and Esther was not small. She was 400 pounds at the time. Um, and I just wanted her to be able to run, have that ability. We had a harness for Esther that we had made, and so we could walk her in the neighborhood. But it was super dangerous. People weren't used to seeing a pig being walked in the neighborhood. <laughs> so people driving would slam on the brakes in their car and they would reverse up the street and, you know, cause, you know, not <laughs> thankfully no accidents were caused, but we stopped walking her in the neighborhood for fear that an accident would happen. Um, and uh, so she was just confined to our backyard and our backyard was only 60 feet across, you know, your typical city yard. 
and Esther mm -hmm. could not really run in the backyard. No. She could take a few quick strides and that was it. So I imagined for the longest time, I just could not wait until she was able to run. And when we brought her here and she got off the trailer and she cut a line. That she, very same day, like yeah. within a few minutes of getting off the trailer, yeah, she full speed. And we'd never seen her go so fast. We didn't know <laughs> even that pigs could go so fast. <laughs> And it's a game. It's one of those things one. that you, these animals are, are capable of things that you would never think of just because A, they don't typically get the opportunity or B, you don't get the opportunity to see it. Um, but yeah, seeing her run was, was amazing. I would say the same, that that was my, my favorite moment because she just, as fast as she could go and as far as she could go, she just ran full speed. It was amazing. Great. And, you know, interestingly enough about this session was only supposed to be half an hour. Steve and Derek, they're, they're very, very busy. And we managed to, to squeeze in a half an hour into their schedule. But, and, and I was also, you know, concerned how the students, how long the students were able to go with a QA. and a And uh, we ended up going an hour um, just because they didn't want to stop. Um, and the students didn't want to stop. And Esther was sleeping happily. She didn't care either way. Um, so it was quite, it was quite amazing. And the, the questions that the students asked were just really blew my mind. It was incredible, incredible. Um, so, you know, the, these were the two main anchor points uh, for this uh, project were these two virtual field trips, but there was actually a, a 10 period a unit that was built around um, these two field trips. And um, I've, I've shared the link there in the slides and I'm, happy to provide that to anybody. Um, it includes um, everything you'd really need to know um, about running this type of project, um, all of the, the pre-lessons and the field trip lessons, and then also the post lessons with rubrics, et cetera, and, and uh, activities, et cetera. So um, you are welcome uh, to peruse that. Um, and and the, the, the main takeaway, what they were building towards through all of this work, including the two virtual trips, um, were they were getting into groups uh, virtually and uh, they were choosing a type of sanctuary or any sanctuary around the world um, and, and doing a deep dive onto the research about that sanctuary, what it was all about, and then presenting that uh, to the rest of the class. So it was amazing to see the wide variety. We had like, you know, marine sanctuaries, but then we also have wildlife sanctuaries, farm sanctuaries, exotic animal sanctuaries. Um, so the whole gamut, um, you really could see um, how their uh, knowledge had really increased there. And, and the students really loved the project. They loved being able to find something that they were passionate about themselves and uh, being able to share that with the rest of the class. So, I did do a pre-unit survey and a post-unit survey. I just wanted to get a sense of what impact, if any, um, the trips had had and the project had had. Um, I asked a number of questions, uh, but this is just a couple of examples. So rate your understanding what an animal sanctuary is. This is pre-project. And you can see um, a lot of the students maybe had some idea, but not really. It's kind of a mixed bag there. And then if we go to um, post, uh, unit, um, you can see the vast majority of them have a level four or level five understanding of what a sanctuary is, which was really important uh, for them to take that away to really kind of get that into their systems. Um, and then we also have just some more of the qualitative things. It was like one of the questions was, what are your main takeaways? So one student said, I learned how similar primates are to humans. I also was oblivious to the fact that there was, um, that they were, uh, why they were used for experiments. I also realized that there are a lot of people that really cared and dedicated their lives to accommodate these animals. Um, my main takeaway was that farm animals can also be protected since I always considered farm animals as stuff that we eventually eat. And then finally, uh, definitely the online field trips. I listened to each and every one with my entire family. It was so interesting to see the lives of the, of the animals and their carers. It was an amazing opportunity to ask questions and interact with these two sanctuaries. And that was, that was also very common. And again, this is something neat about the virtual environment is that we had a lot of families getting on and people were sending me photos of the whole family huddled around 
um, a computer to take part in the uh, virtual field trip. So we would be able to do if we were doing it in person. And then I also asked them, hey, given everything that we've done in this unit, what are, what's, a, what's one next step that you could do maybe to contribute to animal protection? And again, like the variety of responses were amazing, but I just chose a few years. When we could start off with meatless Mondays and then slowly eat less meat. I'm also, I've also heard of burgers that are completely made um, of vegetables, like impossible foods. Uh, my family already makes sure to never buy product tested on animals, and maybe we could also cut down on meat, uh, for example, have it one day a week or something. Um, I could refrain from going to places where animals are used as entertainment, um, like a circus. And I uh, would st start only buying makeup and facial products that have not been tested on animals. So again, it, I was really impressed by just the wide breadth. Of, were there weren't these kind of the stock answers, like I'm going to stop eating meat or, you know, there was quite a, a wide range of understanding of just the degree that we exploit animals. Um, and there was a lot of advantages actually that emerged because at first when I had to cancel the don donkey sanctuary field trip, uh, the in-person one, I said, oh, that's such a, such a bummer. You know, the kids were really looking forward to it. Could you ever kind of replace that in-person experience? Uh, is it going to be as magical? And, you know, the answer I think is yes. And in fact, I think there was a lot of advantages to this, a bit of a silver lining. So one is that, I mean, for the foreseeable future, virtual trips might be the only option. Um, you know, who knows when this is gonna lift, especially depending where you live. I know in Ontario, uh, field trips, I, I think pretty much have been canceled uh, across the province and we don't know when that's gonna be opened up again. Um, the other thing is you can go anywhere in the world and I'll show you some examples of that in a sec. Um, you're not limited to just how far you can go in a bus. Um, so we actually did some optional field trips to the Sla Sanctuary in Costa Rica and a Rhino Sanctuary in Kenya. Um, and another thing is just the reality. I know there are some places that like the Donkey Sanctuary and I think Farm Sanctuary that do do in-person school trips, but a lot of them don't, including Storybook and, and uh, Heaps. Um, and there was things that I hadn't thought of when I um, first reached out to them. is like, you know, like washroom facilities for hundred kids, insurance, um, staffing, educational programming, a lot of sanctuaries, this is just not a, a possibility. It's a lot of work to do something like that. And then, you know, maybe most importantly is that it's better for the animals. You know, I, I started rethinking, you know, having a hundred students at a sanctuary, you know, what that would look like and the pressure that puts on the students. And both these sanctuaries are very cognizant about um, limiting human interaction because of the stress that it can cause for the animals. And then finally, I mean, the, the cost savings were enormous. Um, the, the donkey sanctuary field trip was going to cost me a few thousand bucks and this ended up costing me a fraction of doing that um, other than mainly making the donations to both sanctuaries. Um, so I just didn't want to limit it. These are two uh, examples from Ontario and maybe during the discussion we can talk about um, some that are, are more on the west coast but um, there's a whole host of resources that have popped up um, especially with, uh, uh, with the pandemic. Um, this is one exploring by the seed pants. This was actually started by a guy named Joe Grabowski. He was a former uh, math and science elementary teacher in Ontario. He started about five years ago, but he, he's been doing free virtual speakers and field trips. Um, and it's a whole host of things, but, but he also focuses on sanctuaries. Um, so the Rhino Sanctuary in Kenya, a turtle hospital in Florida, um, the Toucan Rescue Ranch, uh, which focuses on toucan sloths and owls. So I had the students, I gave that as an option that they could participate in some of these and some of them did. And that was absolutely incredible to be Zoomed live um, to Kenya to, you know, be live with rhinos or to be live with the sloths in the comfort of our own homes here. Um, also Farm Sanctuary, um, they have live virtual presentations and they also have a neat thing. They have 24 hour webcams. So you can kind of check in with the animals that way. Um, Barn Sanctuary in Michigan, they also have started doing this summer, started doing virtual field trips. They have free Facebook walk arounds and various videos that they have online. And then they also, I haven't seen it, but there's a reality show on Animal Planet that was created um, about their sanctuary, which so you could have the students tune in to uh, recordings of that as well. Uh, there's an elephant sanctuary in Tennessee. So they've also started a free virtual field trip program photos, Q&A, live streaming, um, 
in the elephant habitats. So that's, that's an amazing, and again, you get a, a sense of the breadth of sanctuaries that are offering um, these educational opportunities. Um, there's the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Utah. So this, I, the reason I include this one is, is neat. They actually have a VR uh, tour. So it's, I think, eight or 10 minutes. Um, I use uh, some Google Cardboard headsets with my students. They're like, you know, 10 or 15 bucks and you just slip your phone in there. Um, so that's an amazing kind of behind the scenes tour of a sanctuary and it doesn't have to be live. You can actually just uh, play that whenever you want. Um, and then this was something that it's not really sanctuaries, but it's actually going right into the wild um, with some of the explore.org live cams. So uh, going underwater with the beluga whales, uh, orcas on BC and sea lions in BC. So that's uh, pretty spectacular as well. And um, that is it for my presentation. So I just wanted to see if anybody um, had any questions or comments or critique of anything that I've uh, presented today. We do have one question for you. Um, Mike, what is the demographic of your student population in regards to race, ethnicity, language, as well as special education needs? Right, yeah, so uh, it's an independent school. It's geared towards um, very highly motivated and, and high achieving students. So it's, it's a bit of a, a niche, I guess, demographic in that sense. Um, it's quite diverse in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, uh, we don't have an ESL program. So, um, you know, the students kind of are, are learning in an English environment. And um, we do have um, special education students, um, although the proportion would probably be less than your average uh, school in, in Toronto. Great, so we have that answer. So if anybody else has any more questions, please put it in the Q&A or in the chat and we can try and answer it. But I really love what you've done. And then, okay, we've got one. Can you see it in the, ch oh, no, in the chat? Yes, let me take a look here. Okay. So uh, I see virtual, uh, okay, so I don't see. Virtual, oh. sanctuary. virtual sanctuaries are, feel, I was like, so from engage to all panelists, virtual sanctuary field trips are the way to go. It's somewhat of a contradiction to allow the general public. Yeah, that, so engage, I completely, um, agree with that. And, and that, that actually was something I learned um, after the fact. Again, it was that silver lining because it, it was so much easier, um, you know, for the animals. And again, you know, students maybe aren't necessarily the most aware. And, and to be honest, we're, you know, we're all used to animals kind of serving us. Um, if we go to a zoo or they're, they're usually there for us to be entertained in some way, shape or form. So, um, to, to try and, and flip that, it's a, that's a big change, but to do it virtually, you know, the, the animals are protected that way, so. Um, I have two yeah. kind of similar questions. Um, one is, did you meet any resistance from parents when doing these field trips? Um, and then it was from someone else as well. Were there any concerns for more conservative families that didn't agree with veganism that students took away from visiting the sanctuaries? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, yeah, so resistance from parents, um, you know, I didn't have any resistance. Uh, um, and in fact, a number of the families participated. I, it was interesting. In one of my classes, um, one of the students, her, her mom um, was a researcher or is a researcher at the University of Toronto and did animal experimentation. And, um, and so I was, it was because we'd kind of done a deep dive in that in preparation for the storybook, the primate sanctuary uh, field trip. And it was something that I was aware of, but um, uh, that student and her mom actually, you know, reached out to me. They were very, very supportive of the whole thing. I think, because I, I tried to do it in a very spacious way, you know, in terms of, of not being judgmental and allowing students to kind of draw their own conclusions about things. Um, so that was, I was really heartened by that, the fact that we could actually have a good discussion about it. Um, and then in the other is, were there concerns from more conservative families that didn't agree with veganism that students took away from it? So again, I personally, I didn't um, hear anything. Um, there might have been things behind the scenes um, about that, but, um, you know, a lot of the students, 
Um, you know, I, I also mentioned one of the questions in the post um, survey was what were some challenges you might come up against in terms of trying to um, incorporate animal protection into your life. And, you know, they were very realistic about that. A lot of them don't really have much say about what they're going to be eating or, you know, what if they're going to be going to the zoo or not. Um, and so they were clear about that, but a lot of them seem to have, you know, some type of open communication with their parents too. So, yeah. So would you say like the, your, your approach was more of like a Socratic questions leading by example approach? Is that why? You find that there was yeah better? I I don't mean I I'm not because I in terms of the Socratic it wasn't even necessarily that I didn't have like an end kind of goal like of I just really wanted and and part of it is because I didn't really know what I was doing to be totally honest I I dove <laughs> into this and and I didn't have this kind of structured okay I know they're at point A and I want them to get to point D and we're gonna I'm gonna lead them through these steps. I, I, I just really wanted to give them the opportunity to explore engaging with animals in a completely different way. That's to, awesome. to give them a chance to, to see a sanctuary and to visit one. And then I just wanted to see what was going to happen. And, um, and I was really quite amazed by you know, what the students uh, took away from that. And again, that was anecdotally just in talking to them mm -hmm. and their families, but also um, through some of the survey results too. Perfect. Oh, did you have, there's one more quick one. Um, yeah. Was there any follow-up activities? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Um, for better or for worse, I'm actually on academic leave this year, uh, working on my master's degree. So unfortunately I'm not, it would be brilliant if I could actually be you know, with the students again uh, this year. Um, so I'll, I'll have to see, I know that there's an animal justice group that started at the school so there's ways of students getting involved with that. Um, and my feeling is that um, the teachers are gonna be running these virtual field trips again this year coming up. So um, uh, yeah, the only, in terms of the follow-up, there was the scaffolding, again, this whole unit and kind of them doing the research themselves. And, and th there was follow-up that way in terms of them being able to kind of deepen their learning. But in terms of being able to follow up with Again, some of those survey questions are like, oh, were you actually successful in implementing any things you wanted to do? Or how have your attitudes or knowledge or behavior changed anyway? Uh, I don't have that info, yeah. Great, we answered that one. Awesome, well, thank you again so much for taking the time and doing the presentation and sharing your knowledge. And um, we will be in touch. Great, thank you. And thanks again, uh, Srin, for um, organizing this is really brilliant. It's such a great um, outlet for people to learn about these things. So well, thank you. I just want to promote what you're doing and everybody okay. else. <laughs> great. Thank you. Spread the love. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.